This is PediaCast. Welcome to PediaCast, a pediatric podcast for parents. And now, direct from the campus of Nationwide Children's, here is your host, Dr. Mike. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to PediaCast. It is a pediatric podcast for moms and dads. This is Dr. Mike coming to you from the campus of Nationwide Children's Hospital. We're in Columbus, Ohio. It's episode 551. We're calling this one Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology. I want to welcome all of you to the program. So uh, there were some big medical words <laughs> and a little jargon in the title there today. Uh, just to break it down, uh, orthopedic refers to bones and oncology refers to cancer. And so we are going to talk about uh, bone cancer in children and teenagers today. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to point out that for many of you, and, and including myself, uh, you, you can have some post-holiday blues. And I just wanted to, to check in and see how all of you uh, are doing now that the holidays are over. You know, there's always a big buildup for the holidays. And whether you are a person who, you know, starts decorating and, and getting the Christmas tree up and listening to holiday music uh, right after Halloween, you know, there's there's many of us who like to do that. And yes, I am one of them. Uh, and then there's others that are like, hey, and it, it, it we don't even say the word Christmas. We don't think about the December, uh, early January holidays uh, until Thanksgiving is over. And sometimes there's a difference of opinion within the same household, uh, which I'm sure is true for many of you. And so, you know, the holidays are an exciting time, whether you, you start them early or you start them late. Great time to get together with family and friends. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're over. And, uh, you know, you're taking down the, the decorations and the lights and uh, often if you, you know, especially if you live in the Midwest uh, and other parts of the United States, uh, the weather's not so great in January. And so, you know, it's cold and gray and you may not see the sun for a few days. And so uh, that adds into the whole not getting enough sunlight and having a seasonal affective disorder. And you can understand how those things all kind of come crashing together uh, to really cause a drop and and to have you know depression, uh, not feeling so great about things. And so I just want to encourage you that uh, you're not alone in that. And uh, especially if it's impacting uh, your life, your quality of life, your ability to, to be a good parent and uh, to go to work and you know it's really affecting you, uh, please do get help. And uh, uh, there's all sorts of help you can get if you don't know where to go. A great place to start is your primary care provider. If you don't have one, please uh, get yourself one. And uh, they can certainly uh, point you in the right direction. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you are thinking about hurting yourself or ending your life, uh, if it's really gotten to that point, um, which and it's important to talk about these things, uh, then definitely get help right away. And, uh, you know, all communities have a psychiatric crisis department. If you don't know where to go, go to your local emergency department and uh, they'll be able to uh, point you in the right direction. Uh, some helpful hints on uh, combating uh, the post-holiday blues. You know, stay active, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be expensive, especially after the holidays. Uh, you can have a dance party, you know, get some indoor gym time, maybe at the YMCA, uh, get your aerobic exercise and strength training in, you know, and you can certainly find fun activities you can enjoy. Here in Central Ohio, you know, we have a great uh, science museum in COSI uh, just down the road over in Dayton. We have the Air the Air and Space Museum, which is really fun. Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame up in Cleveland. And, and, and of course, there's many, many other fun things to do around that are indoors. And, you know, so plan a trip, you know, even if it's just in a couple couple weeks, uh, at least you have something to look forward to. Uh, light boxes can also be helpful, especially when they're used in the morning. So, you know, when you get up uh, as you're having your breakfast, a light box there uh, can can be helpful. But the, the most important thing is to get professional help, you know, really, if this is uh, I impacting your life, because it's common. And I just, just want to acknowledge that. All right. So again, we are talking about uh, bone cancers in children and teenagers. Now, fortunately, today's topic is a rare one. Uh, less than a thousand cases of bone cancer are diagnosed in the United States each year. 
Um, it's really rare in adults. When it does happen, it's usually in a child or a teenager. Um, and, and the reason really is that bones are still growing in kids. And uh, tumors, remember, represent sort of out-of-control cell growth. And uh, bone cancers are often uh, diagnosed late because the symptoms can be uh, nonspecific. So we're going to talk about that more today. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss, um, you know, who is at risk, uh, what are the symptoms, how, how are bone cancers diagnosed, uh, what does treatment look like, what about the uh, long-term outcomes and survival rates, and then uh, what are the hot topics in research related to pediatric orthopedic oncology, and uh, where can uh, young patients and families impacted by bone cancers uh, find support? So we'll talk about all of these things. We have a terrific guest with us today, Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt. He is a pediatric orthopedic oncologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital and also director of the Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology Program at Nationwide Children's. So uh, much more uh, coming up with him. Uh, real quick, before we get to that interview, uh, let me remind you that you can find PediaCast really wherever podcasts are found. Uh, we always appreciate when you uh, leave a review of the program. And we love connecting with you on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter or X. Simply search for PediaCast. We also have a contact link over at PediaCast.org if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Also, I want to remind you the information presented in PediaCast is for general educational purposes only. We do not diagnose medical conditions or formulate treatment plans for specific individuals. If you have a concern about your child's health, be sure to call your healthcare provider. Also, your use of this audio program is subject to the PediaCast Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at PediaCast.org. So let's take a quick break. We'll get Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt settled into the studio, and then we will be back to talk about pediatric orthopedic oncology. It's coming up right after this. Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt is an orthopedic surgeon and director of the Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology Program at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's also a professor of orthopedics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. He's here to talk about bone cancers in children and teenagers. But first, let's give a warm PediaCast welcome to our guest, Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by and visiting with us today. Sure. Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, let's just start with the basics. Uh, what exactly is uh, pediatric orthopedic oncology and uh, what makes this field of medicine unique? Sure. So it's a, it's a fairly niche field in orthopedics. Um, uh, most people who go into orthopedics tend to gravitate towards things like sports medicine or joint replacement or fracture fixa fixation, sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of orthopedics, where uh, we in musculoskeletal oncology uh, deal with primary uh, bone sarcomas, primary soft tissue sarcomas, which are uh, cancerous tumors that start in the tissues that hold you together. So start in the connective tissues like bone or muscle or fat. Um, and we also deal uh, when we see metastatic lesions that spread to, to, the, to the bone or skeletal structures. Um, a, a fair bit of my practice also does benign bone and soft tissue things. So there's a, a lot of benign conditions we see that affect the bone as well that, that we'll handle that's in the realm of orthopedic oncology. And as we think about can bone cancers, um, my understanding is that they're actually more common in uh, the pediatric population than in the adult population. Is that true? That's true. I mean, uh, primary bone cancers, uh, what we call the, the, the cancers actually start in the bone itself, uh, as a population, luckily are, are fairly rare. There's probably maybe seven to 800 cases a year in the whole United States of all bone cancers. That includes the adult and pediatric population. But the majority of those do occur in the pediatric population when we see them. It's, it's fairly rare to see a primary bone tumor in an adult. And then what are the most common uh, orthopedic cancers that you see in kids? There's, there's really only two. Um, um, there's obviously always variations on, on the theme of those. But uh, the two primary bone, primary bone tumors we see are osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas. And uh, those are going to, but again, the, the overall prevalence of these uh, is, is pretty low in the, in the general population. Of course, if your family's impacted by this, if it's your child, then it means the world. And so it's, it's really those low numbers don't mean a lot when you're looking at individual families 
who are impacted by these diseases. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for for the osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, again, there's probably a couple hundred cases of the year uh, 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 in the entire year that happen in the entire country. But if it happens to you, your family, um, obviously, we want to make sure you're getting the best care possible. And it, you know, for these rare tumors, I think it just highlights the importance of really having specialized centers that, that take care of these on a routine basis, even though they're relatively rare tumors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do uh, bone cancers usually uh, present in children? So are, are there specific symptoms that parents should watch for? Yeah, and that, that's what makes it difficult is uh, the symptoms um, are, are relatively vague. I mean, obviously, if you, you see or feel a, a mass that's growing, that's, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, but more commonly, these, these kids will present with pain. Um, and when you're talking about kids that are obviously playing sports and running around and always injuring themselves, um, there's routinely a delay in diagnosis, mainly because of the, the vague presentation. But, but to answer your question, pain and a growing mass are sort of the two hallmark signs of a, of a bone cancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this is our, our podcast for parents, but we also have a lot of uh, pediatricians and other pediatric providers who listen. Um, you know, we all see kids who, you know, the parent brings them in because of leg pain, for example. Um, it's often when we, when we hear it, you know, it's at the end of the day. Uh, the the child's you know going to bed and they're complaining that their leg hurts and you know we we call these you know growing pains sometimes I don't know that growth really hurts but um you know, more likely uh, most of these kids are going to have uh, you know a strain or a sprain or you know just they've overused their muscles and now that things have quieted down um, they're paying attention to their to you know where they hurt and are more likely to say something and we see that a lot so how do you differentiate that sort of presentation with, you know, what, what would be different that would make us worry about there being a bone cancer? Because we don't necessarily want to get x-rays and blood work in all of these kids. Otherwise, you'd, you know, you'd overdo it then. Right. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's really, you're hitting on the sort of crux of what the struggle of diagnosis can sometimes be. And, you know, we, we know from a couple of large studies, the, the average time looking back from when a child starts to have pain to the time they actually get imaging or we start to worry about it being a, a bone cancer is somewhere around three or four months, um, which is which feels like a long time. And, you know, um, parents oftentimes will sort of beat themselves up a little bit and say, gosh, it's been three months. We've thought this was, you know, um, John's little guy was having growing pains or he had a soccer injury and gosh, we really missed it. And there's, you know, we deal a lot with just the reassurance to the to the parents and the team that that's just the way that these things present. There's always a delay um, because most of the time it is going to be some sort of muscle strain, growing pain, soccer injury, football injury, whatever that may be. So uh, I think what we sort of counsel is if it's a if it's a pain that sticks around longer than it feels like it should, um, or if it really is con- um, consistently waking the, the the child up from sleep, that's something that we should probably see and evaluate with at least an X-ray as an initial step. Uh, to make sure we're not missing an early stage of one of these one of these bone cancers. Yeah, and I I think that's an important um, distinction because uh, most of these kids, you know, that we see don't wake up in the middle of the night with the pain. Um, oftentimes they're still playing and active during the day. You know, it's more in the evening when they start to complain. Um, so I guess you know from the from the provider standpoint, if you have a kid who the parent tells you they're waking up in the middle of the night or uh, the pain is there all day or it's lasting, you know, we don't necessarily want it to go three to four months. If you have a pain in a particular place that's lasted more than a couple of weeks, um, probably ought to at least see someone. And uh, um, and as a providers, we ought to put this in the in the back of our head as a, as a possibility, even though it's a rare one. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's pretty uh, safe and inexpensive to get a plain x-ray uh, radiograph done. So um, if there's any question, oftentimes it's better to just get that image to make sure, again, we're not missing something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, What recent advances have been made in diagnosing these conditions? Is there anything new or is it really still just an x-ray? And then um, are you able to tell what it is just by how it looks on the x-ray? Or do you have to get more advanced imaging? uh, Or is there blood work that you can do to to nail down the diagnosis? Sure. So the the plain x-rays usually give us a pretty good uh, guess, I will, or at least start to raise a little red flag that that's what we're worried about. And if the x-ray is at all concerning, we usually do follow that up with some advanced imaging, typically an MRI scan, uh, which will give us a lot more information about sort of the internal characteristics and the soft tissue surrounding uh, the area of question. Um, unfortunately, for these type of cancers, uh, there's no blood work uh, detection that's available. So blood work is typically normal. Um, 
a lot of times we'll do a little blood work because uh, infection can sometimes masquerade as a, as, as a tumor and vice versa. So uh, we'll, we'll oftentimes get blood work more from an infection evaluation than anything else. But from, from a tumor biology standpoint, there's no blood work that will help us. So uh, uh, once we get that x-ray and MRI scan, if there's still worry, then typically a biopsy is going to be the next step in the, in the treatment algorithm. And the biopsy, is that done in the operating room? Uh, it can be done in two ways, uh, either done in the operating room where we do what's called an open biopsy, where we make a little incision and actually take a small sample of the, the area of concern, uh, or it can be done with our interventional radiology colleagues as well, where it's done with just, uh, with just a needle biopsy. So depending on the characteristics of, of the imaging uh, and the location of where this is, it could be done in either one of those two ways. And then the biopsy is taken to the lab, a pathologist looks at it under the microscope and uh, maybe does some various testing that <laughs> that I'm not well versed on, and uh, and then lets you know whether it is uh, a cancerous or a benign uh, bone lesion that that you're seeing there. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And then w- once you have the diagnosis of an osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, um, what treatment options are available? And I would imagine that you probably collaborate with some other pediatric subspecialists in that case as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean we. We uh, have a really robust team here of sarcoma specialists, and we really uh, feel and, and treat this like it's a team sport. So, you know, once we make the diagnosis, we we very early on, and even probably even prior to diagnosis, get our medical oncology team uh, on board and meeting with the family uh, to sort of talk through just potential directions it may go. Uh, obviously, we work very closely with our pathology team and our radiology team. Um, but once we get into establishing the diagnosis, uh, the treatment protocols for either one of those common cancers, the osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, is fairly protocol-driven across the country. So essentially, you get the same treatment here as you would at MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering or any other uh, uh, center, uh, children's hospital or cancer center in the United States. And they're really driven by children's oncology group protocols, where it's a combination typically uh, of chemotherapy and what we call local control, which is usually an operation to actually remove remove that cancerous tumor. Um, I know in other areas of, uh, of cancer uh, medicine, uh, a lot of times you can look at the person's genes to figure out like what the best therapy might be uh, because they have in the past um, looked at the outcomes with various therapies and uh, then start to make connections between particular genes and what might work better or not. Is that also true with orthopedic oncology or are we not really there yet in, in terms of being able to personalize the treatment plan? That's a, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's an emerging area that we're, uh, we're exploring actively uh, with, these, with these bone cancers. We typically get genetic testing done on, on virtually all these patients. Uh, in addition, the tumors typically undergo a very robust pathologic analysis where we get genomic evaluation of the actual tumor itself. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't really found um, how that's going to translate into uh, treatment uh, regimens or, or therapeutic regimens at this point in time, uh, but it's certainly something that's, that's, again, on the emerging front and we're actively exploring. When you have a disease that has such a low incidence in the general population, it's definitely more difficult to study. Uh, because, which is a good thing. I mean, you have, it's it's not good for the folks who are impacted by this, uh, for sure. Um, but I guess, you know, low incidence is good for, for those who aren't, and there would be more otherwise. Uh, so I guess that must, it must be kind of frustrating, not that you wish more cancers for sure, uh, but it does make it more difficult to, to, um, to move forward and evolve in treatment when there's few opportunities to, to treat these diseases. Yeah, it's it's uh, definitely one of the struggles in, in sarcoma care is you know unfortunately research resources and and grant funding and all those things is is a, is a finite pie and um, when you look at overall you know uh, effects on population sometimes as a, as a rare disease it's difficult to get the same right resources that say people with you know breast cancer or colon cancer or the the more common cancers where there's literally millions of cases a year oftentimes um, sort of probably rightfully so but oftentimes get a majority of those resources. So yeah. um, sometimes getting meaningful stuff done on a rare cancer is, is certainly a challenge. Um, from the parent's lens, uh, as they get this diagnosis that their child has a bone cancer, um, probably one of the first things that comes in their mind is, are they going to lose a, an arm or a leg? Um, is that something that happens frequently or with today's treatments, is that is that even more rare? Yeah, it's an, it's an, inter- it's an interesting question and, and a great point um, because I think 
uh, probably 90 plus percent of the time we can perform what's called a limb salvage surgery, meaning we don't have to consider an amputation. Uh, but that being said, we've also made some uh, just massive advances in our amputee patients when they do unfortunately have to undergo an amputation uh, where we can do things to improve their function and improve their uh, sort of daily living, even with an amputation. And sometimes their function can maybe better than a complex limb salvage surgery. So uh, although we are usually able to salvage most uh, most limbs, um, we certainly have this discussion where we go through all the options and, uh, and take uh, the family and the child wishes and expectations into account uh, to really try to personalize that decision for each of those families. Um, I imagine that uh, when if a child is, is impacted by one of these uh, cancers and they play sports, um, that can be you know devastating for these kids. Um, is there a role in physical therapy and rehabilitation you know for all of these kids, but it, in particular, if they uh, are playing a sport, is it is it reasonable to think that they may be able to return to their sport? Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's also obviously going to be a very individualized discussion as far as, you know, where the cancer is located, what the surgery will take to remove the cancer, what the sport is that they're playing, um, as well as what our reconstructed options are. Um, so we try to, again, have a lot of discussions preoperatively as we're, we're making those decisions to try to personalize that approach for patients. Um, but oftentimes we we are able to get uh, get these kids back doing the things that they want to do. Granted, there may be some adaptations and things we have to take into consideration. Um, but for for a lot of kids, we're able to get them back doing things they want to do. And as you mentioned, the uh, the team, uh, the sarcoma team, um, I would imagine that mental health professionals, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors um, would also be a part of this because there is certainly uh, a mental health toll that takes place whenever there's a cancer diagnosis. Oh, a hundred percent. Again, we have a very, very robust team here, and that includes our our support services, like you mentioned. Um, obviously, dealing with a child with cancer not not only is it tough on uh, on the kid, uh, but it's extraordinarily tough on the family and and support staff and um, uh, brothers, sisters, those sorts of things that are also going through this. So we have a lot of a lot of resources in place and available, uh, both both locally here within within Children's, uh, as well as connecting the families with the different. Uh, patient advocacy groups and different families that have been down that road to try to connect and, and make sure we're giving the best support we can. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the in the show notes, um, we're going to have some uh, links to particular resources that folks uh, may find helpful. So I'd encourage families to uh, check out the uh, the website pdacast.org and look in the show notes for this episode. Uh, 551, and you'll be able to find those resources there. Just uh, some examples: um, the St. Baldrick's Foundation. Um, has a nice site with lots of support information and uh, solving kids' cancer is another one. And uh, I'm sure that if there are others, you will let us know and we'll include those in the show notes too, because those resources are really so important uh, for families. Um, what about the um, prognosis for for these cancers, sort of the long term? You know, when we hear about cancers, we think about survival rates. Um, is that something that we talk to families about with uh, with the bone cancers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important to, even though they're tough conversations, those are important uh, transparent conversations that need to happen early on just to, again, set expectations and, and, and more importantly, make sure we're supporting the family the best that we can. So um, one, of the, one of the big challenges we've had with both osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma is we really haven't seen a meaningful bump in our survival rates over about the last 20 to 25 years. And a lot of it is really limited to the things we've already highlighted. It's a very rare cancer. Um, resources can be limited in terms of studying things. Um, so we've, we've had some challenges uh, in improving our survival rates overall. Um, so the, 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 the things that we talk about is once we make the diagnosis of this cancer, the next step is we want to make sure it hasn't spread anywhere else. You know, By definition of it being a cancer means it can metastasize or spread to other areas. Uh, and for these cancers, the lungs is the primary area we worry about. So we get some scans done on the lungs to make sure everything looks clear there. When we talk about overall survival rate, as long as it presents in what we call localized disease, meaning it hasn't spread, and it is surgically resectable, meaning we can remove the cancer at the appropriate time, our survival rates are somewhere between 65 and 85% at five years. So uh, they're not great, but we, we're doing everything we can to try to optimize and improve upon those on really a daily basis. And I think for for listeners out there, um, this is an area where if you're thinking about um, you know philanthropy and uh, and helping support research efforts, this is going to be a good one 
um, because it is, again, a rare disease. Oftentimes funding is lacking. And so, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of supporting other families who may be impacted by this, this is definitely an opportunity uh, to help your neighbor. Absolutely. I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, we could definitely, uh, definitely use help if available. And, um, you know, one of the luxuries we have here at Nationwide is that we, we really have one of the leading sarcoma centers in the country, which is probably a, l- a little known fact to the community here. But um, when we look at all the different clinical trials and the different things we're doing surgically, uh, we're really one of the, n- the nation's leaders in taking care of kids with this, with this what could be devastating diagnosis. So yeah. uh, certainly welcome any, any help we can get. When, when, um, when, we're, when we look at the whole program, um, you had mentioned uh, just how strong of a team that we have here at Nationwide Children's. And especially when you have a disease that um, does not impact that many people, you really do want to go to a center that has experience um, treating these kind of things. And so, uh, as you mentioned, you know, it's a little known fact that we have such a great sarcoma program uh, that's really nationally recognized. Uh, But the folks who don't live in central Ohio, it is important to know that we do have a great one. And we do see folks who travel uh, to Columbus um, in order to, to be treated for their sarcoma, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we've uh, we've seen uh, and continue to see uh, referrals and just even second opinions from really all over the U.S. and internationally. We we get referrals from really all over the world, and um, uh, obviously, the more that we do here, the better that our team also gets at it, and the more we learn about this. So we really welcome you know as many as many patients as we can, even if it's just for a second opinion, so we can learn something from them as well. And I would imagine that we have support. Uh, for folks who travel in terms of helping them find a place to stay, you know, to because, you know, you're away from home and this all becomes more difficult and complicated. And so sort of having a team um, follow, going you know, on this journey with you uh, can can be very helpful. And so, uh, you know, I, we will, of course, put a link in the show notes to the Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology Program at Nationwide Children's. And so p- folks hopefully will be able to get connected with you uh, very easily. Um, let's uh, talk about the future. Um, what are some of the uh, hopes and goals that you have uh, in this field? Well, obviously, we, we want to improve our survival rates and 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 good functional outcomes for these kids. So, um, you know, we have a lot of research going on, both in the overall treatment of the disease in terms of clinical trials and uh, a few of the things we hit on either earlier, looking at, you know, the genetic profiling and looking for better targets that we can do to hopefully keep these cancers from spreading and improve the survivability of the cancer. Uh, and then, uh, in, in my world, particularly in the surgical world, you know, we want to give these kids the best function that we can. So we're doing a lot of local research here on, on things like 3D printing, virtual surgical planning, uh, doing things to make our surgeries for these kids both safer and more predictable and, and better functional outcomes. So, you know, on, on, the, on the global scale, we want to obviously improve our survivability. But um, while patients and families are going through this, we want to make it as as comfortable and as easy a journey as we can for them. So we're trying to improve all in all those aspects of care. Um, what advice do you have for parents who um, get this diagnosis and they're navigating this journey? What, what are some of the challenges and uh, barriers that they may face and, and how can they overcome those? Yeah, I think it's important to, to connect with other families that have walked that journey already um, for them. So again, connecting with some of the other patient advocacy groups, or we help connect with families here locally that have been down a similar path. I think you know, in a, in a rare disease, just feeling like you're not alone in, in, in fighting it is really important. So, um, you know, I think we we try to connect families very early on. And then I think I would encourage uh, families to, you know, don't be afraid to to ask for or get second opinions or third opinions or, you know, as many opinions as you need to, to feel comfortable with where your child's being treated, that they're getting the best care they can um, from practitioners that are, that are, that are the leaders of the field. So, um, you know, oftentimes I think um, families can feel bad about that for some reason, but we try to encourage uh, parents and and help arrange for those second and third opinions if need be, just to to again give them the comfort that they're getting the the best care they can for their child. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm sure that that could become um, frustrating from from your point of view. It'd be easy for that to become frustrating, but I think uh, the fact you have that empathy of you know the parent really does want to make sure that they've got the right diagnosis the right treatment plan, the right treatment team, you know, that's managing that plan uh, because our kids are the most precious things to us. And so um, I love that you said, hey, it's okay. We encourage a second or third opinion if that's going to make you feel more comfortable uh, because it's it's not that you are criticizing our care. It's that you really want the best care for your child. And really, that's all, all that all of us want. Absolutely. Yep. Well said, Mike. 
All right. Well, uh, uh, we really appreciate you again stopping by today and uh, talking to us about bone cancers in kids, uh, osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas. Um, and I, I will point out one more time that the uh, we'll have a link in the show notes to the Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology Program at Nationwide Children's. And uh, that's something that uh, parents can go to that site. And if they want to get in touch with you, um, they don't necessarily have to have a referral, right? They can just uh, uh, use the, the contact us um, uh, resource at, the, at your website. That's correct. Yeah, happy to connect via email or, or phone call or, or anything really informally, uh, even prior to an actual visit with us, if that's helpful for the families. All right. Well, once again, uh, Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt with Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. back with just enough time to say thanks once again to all of you for taking time out of your day and making PDA cast a part of it. Really do appreciate that. Also, thanks to our guest this week, Dr. Thomas Scharschmidt with Pediatric Orthopedic Oncology at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Don't forget, you can find us wherever podcasts are found. We're in the Apple and Google podcast apps, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, YouTube, and most other podcast apps for iOS and Android. Our landing site is pediacast.org. You'll find our entire archive of past programs there. Show notes for each of the episodes, our terms of use agreement, and that handy contact page if you would like to suggest a future topic for the program. Reviews are helpful wherever you get your podcasts. We always appreciate when you share your thoughts about the show. And we love connecting with you on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, LinkedIn, and Twitter. X, <laughs> simply search for PediaCast. Also, don't forget about our uh, podcast for pediatric professionals. Uh, it's similar to this program. We turn the science up a couple notches and offer free continuing medical education credit for those who listen. It's called PediaCast CME, which of course stands for continuing medical education. And uh, we also offer a CEs uh, for nurses and nurse practitioners, um, pharmacists, psychologists, social workers, dentists, and of course, the CME for uh, physicians. And since Nationwide Children's is jointly accredited by all of those professional organizations, it's likely we offer the exact credits you need to fulfill your state's continuing medical education requirements. Of course, you want to make sure the content of the episode matches your scope of practice. Shows and details are available at the landing site for that program, pediacastcme.org. Also available wherever podcasts are found, simply search for PediaCast CME. Thanks again for stopping by. And until next time, this is Dr. Mike saying stay safe, stay healthy, and stay involved with your kids. So long, everybody. This program is a production of Nationwide Children's. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on PediaCast.